Welcome to episode 10 of Bigfoot for Breakfast. We are Samantha Carter and Sarah Jones. And as usual, we are super happy to have you listening, as well as all of the friends that you told about us, right? Right? All the friends. Anyway, while you're in your podcast listening app, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And if you really want to help out the show, leave us a rating and a review. It's a huge deal to us, and it only takes a few seconds for you and we appreciate it immensely. This past week was Halloween and we had a little contest going for those of you who left a rating and a review for us. We had a drawing for a t-shirt and an insulated coffee mug and we're happy to announce that it was our father, Rich Carter, who was chosen by the Magic Wheelie app. (laughs) I don't even know what it's called. (laughs) Wheel of Fortune? I don't know. Put everyone's name into it so it randomly picked and congratulations, Papa. You're the happy owner of a shiny new glitter mug. (laughs) (laughs) We'll probably Um, not glitter it. No, we will. We should. We will. (laughs) We solemnly swear that that was not rigged. We want to say thank you to everyone who's listening and make sure that you guys know how much we really do appreciate the participation that we got. We really like knowing that we can interact with everybody and that we're keeping your interest and you don't think we're boring and all that stuff. Well, some um, of you. Some we, of you don't. <laughs> some don't, of you might think we're boring. <laughs> we don't know what the rest of you think. <laughs> um, we really wish we could just give everybody the stuff. Unfortunately, we can't. However, we are going to continue having contests in the future to you guys who want it. Shout out, Angie. <laughs> She's ready to murder for a mug. So stay tuned for that, and another one of you will be a lucky winner. Hey, do you like politics, conspiracy, current events, and just plain whimsical nonsense? These topics and more can be found on the Question Everything Guys podcast. A weekly episode podcast available on iTunes, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and various other podcast hosting platforms. No topic is ever too serious. None of the jokes are politically correct, and all of the questions come with minimal answers. Huh? What? Come join your host, Lanny B. Sean. The Mick. On, on the, the Question, Question Everything, Everything Guys podcast. podcast. That's the We've gotten some episode requests. Basically, several of them amount to more aliens. Kyle. Kyle. (laughs) And others. (laughs) So while we can't cover aliens on every show because we must spread the mystery butter across all parts of the imagination bread, we do so love aliens. Suddenly I have like a real serious craving for toast. (laughs) So we're going to go there today. But I can't feel... I can't feel... I can't feel my face. I'm numb. (laughs) But I feel like we can't dive into this otherworldly pool without starting near the beginning. I say near the beginning because the story that we're telling today isn't the first alien encounter ever recorded. Or even maybe the most spectacular. But it did seem to be the one to get the ball rolling in the alien craze and really generate interest in what lies beyond the world we know as planet Earth. So let me set the mood for this one. Fade from black. It's just before midnight on September 19th, 1961. (laughs) Deeper and deeper, deeper sleep. Far asleep. Deeper and deeper. Fully relaxed. All muscles are relaxed. You're comfortable. Relaxed. You will not be anxious or distressed, but you will remember everything and you will tell me everything. Yes. I think I will stop. And I have not stopped. And Betty said, Look, there's a star moving. And I look and I see a star. It's funny. But I said, Betty, that's a satellite. We are seeing a satellite. And then I pulled over to the side of the road. And Betty jumped off her side on her side with the binoculars. And I got the chain, 
and I hook it to the dog on her collar, and I say, come on, Dulcie, let's get out. She jumps out, and I look toward the sky, and I look back to Dulcie, and walk her around the trunk of the car, and I'm saying, hurry up, Betty, so I can get a look. And Betty passes the binoculars to me. And I see that this is not a satellite. It is an airplane. It is an airplane you can see. I think you can see the rows of windows and it is an airplane and I tell Betty this and give the binoculars back to her and I am satisfied. drive and Betty is still looking and she said Bonnie that is not a plane it is still following us and I stop and I look and I see it is still out there off in the distance so I search for a place to pull off the road and I see a dirt road to the right of the main highway. And I think this is a good place I can pull off. And if any car comes, it won't strike me. And I am thinking, this is strange because it is still there. And Betty said, I think she said, I am mad with her. I said, I believe Betty is trying to make me think this is a flying saucer. A young husband and wife were driving home from Canada to Portsmouth, New Canada. New, New Carolina. New Carolina. <laughs> you didn't know? <laughs> there's a new There's a new one. <laughs> North Carolina. Check that. She was peering out the window, admiring the night sky, when she pointed out a light above the horizon that seemed to be moving about in strange ways. It wasn't like any star or plane that they had seen before. She got excited about the unfamiliar sight and she told her husband to pull over. At first, the very reasonable man refused, stating to her that it is just a satellite. But he saw it too, and as the light continued to move more erratically, he became quietly unsure of what he was seeing as well. The light was getting closer, and it seemed to be following them as they drove down the lonely Route 3 highway just outside of Indian Head, New Hampshire. Here is where they slowed to a stop on the side of the road and got out to observe the strange orb, and she jumped out of the car with the binoculars while he grabbed their dog and brought her out with them. He takes the binoculars from his wife and peers through them to get a better look. Maybe it's an airplane. He sees rows of windows while looking at the craft and convinces himself that he's seeing an airplane. The couple gets back in their car when she exclaims, It's not an airplane. It's still following us. He realizes that she's right. So again, he pulls over the car and he gets out to take a better look. Wait. Husband realizing that his wife is right. Nah. That alone makes this a record-breaking affair. And in the 60s. Sure enough, the craft was still there. She's excited, and she's yelling at him with wide eyes. Look at that. It's strange. It's not a plane. Look at it. But, being a sensible guy, he's still sure that she's wrong. He tells her to be quiet, and he listens intently, trying to hear the hum of the plane, to hear the motor. He's becoming annoyed that she keeps trying to convince him that they're seeing a flying saucer, because he refuses to believe this. By now, the craft is close, maybe a thousand feet away. 
and they hear nothing, only quiet. It's very big now, it's closer. And the way it moved was fast, it shot back and forth like they had never seen an aircraft move, like a ball hitting a paddle. He's scared now, and a feeling of overwhelming dread has come over him, and he fights back the urge to show his wife any sign of nervousness. He thinks about his gun in the trunk of the car. He runs quickly for the trunk, he opens it, he grabs the gun and gets back in the car with it. He grabs the binoculars and he peers again at the craft outside of the car. It's still there, and now it's hovering over them, still eerie and quiet. He's shaking and he thinks to himself, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid, I'll shoot it down if I have to, but why doesn't it go away? At this point, the man describes seeing the rows of long windows now without even using the binoculars. Each row is one big window with no dividers and one big bright light filling all the windows. The entire craft is round and flat, like a pancake, he thinks. He tries to convince himself that he is hallucinating or that he is dreaming. He lets his binoculars fall from his face and dangle around his neck, closing his eyes for a moment. He opens them again to find that he is not imagining anything. And now, he's terrified. Why is it still here? What do they want? Through the windows, he can clearly see people now. Nope. Nope. (laughs) One of them appears friendly. He's waving. Hey! (laughs) Hey! Hey! Throwing a peace sign. (laughs) So he has a big round head and slanted eyes, and he's looking at him over its right shoulder, and it's smiling. But he can't see him smile. He can feel feel it. There is another, less friendly being inside the craft that seems hostile. This one is staring at him with an unwavering glare. He feels like this one is more superior and he feels like he's being directed to keep looking and stay where he is. I was looking at him with binoculars. Oh. Did they have faces like other people? You say one reminded you of a red-headed Irishman. His eyes was slanted. I see it so. Oh, his eyes were slanted. But not like a Chinese. What was Betty doing all this time? I, I, I'm not close to her. I don't know. You're out I there by yourself now? Huh? You yeah. don't think of her. Is she saying anything? I can't hear her. Did you make any outcry to her the way you did to me? I, 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 I did I can't remember. I don't know. I did not. You would remember it if you did. I I did not. But I know this this creature, this leader is telling me something. He's telling you something. How? How is he getting it to you? I can see it in his face. Do you see his lips move? Yes. No. His lips aren't moving. Yes. Go on. He's telling you. And he's looking at me. What did he tell you? Stay there and keep looking. Just keep looking and stay there. And just keep looking. Just keep looking. Could you hear each other? Oh, I got to pull these binoculars away from my eyes. Because if I don't, I'll just keep staying there. Could you hear him tell you this? Oh, no. He didn't say it. You felt he said it. I know. You know he's just there. Yeah. Just stay there. He's saying to me. Yeah. All right. I'll dig in my head. Just All go right. Pull All the right. binoculars away. God, give me strength. All right. All pull right. it down. Run. Right. Pull the binoculars down and run. God. It says, my like God, give me strength. I gotta get away. Oh. Oh. So there's 
the head guy, and then there's Moon Moon Alien. Right. Amongst others. God damn it, Moon Moon. <laughs> <laughs> He's not sure how he knows this, but what he wants to do is pull his binoculars away and run. He can't stop looking and he can't move, but every bit of his body is screaming at him to put the binoculars down and run back to the car. Inside of his head, he's screaming, but on the outside, he's silent. He can't hear his wife. He doesn't know where she is, and he doesn't really think of her. He's trapped, and he can't stop looking at their eyes. Finally, somehow, he breaks free, and he frantically runs, trying to get a hold of himself, trying not to panic. She's standing outside the car, so he shouts at his wife to get back in. She does, and he drives, fast. After a few minutes, he can't see the aircraft anymore, but he knows that it's still there those creatures. He feels like they're in his head and he's trying to make sense of what is happening. His wife is in the passenger seat and she's very quiet now. That curious excitement about her before when they first noticed the moving light has since faded. He continues driving a few more minutes and pretty soon he sees bright orange and red lights in the street and he thinks that there's an accident in the road ahead. As they're coming up on the lights, he suddenly hears a series of short beeps and then nothing. He remembers feeling suspended, floating, He remembers their eyes and feeling surprisingly at ease, but he's concerned because the men are standing in the middle of the road and they won't talk to him. He's not in the car now or near the car. He isn't in the woods or near the road. He feels as though he's just floating about. He thinks to himself, I wonder where they came from. How funny. Wrong. It's not funny. That's not funny. I don't know why they keep saying that. It's not funny. Several times they said funny. Oh, no, it's not funny. <laughs> funny ha ha. <laughs> Look at me. I'm drinking wine and eating chicken. <laughs> chicken. <laughs> Thus begins the story of <laughs> Betty and Barney Hill, one of the first majorly publicized alien abduction reports and the story that launched the idea of the greys into popular culture. It was by far, I don't, I do these air quotes. <laughs> Nobody can see the air quotes, but I want you to picture me doing the air quotes. They're frequent. Grays. Now you can't unsee it. It was by far the most widely publicized UFO abduction story of its time and for years to come. From what I read about the Hills, they were just hardworking, regular, everyday people. I'm impressed. I didn't it, it say, folks. say folks. I intentionally <laughs> did. I wrote it. You, you always like, say folks. <laughs> and I was like, Sam is going to complain because <laughs> I don't say folks. I, in fact, do. She, in fact, does. Quite a lot. Barney worked for the United States Postal Service, and Betty was a child welfare caseworker. They were both devoted to their church and their community. Okay. I also want to kind of talk about the fact that Betty and Barney Hill, that story to me, to begin with, was pretty obvious because of the fact that it was one of the first alien abduction stories out into the news and among the people. I also realize that it's been done a lot. I guess the reason that I thought we should do Betty and Barney Hill was because with the coming of a lot of different alien shows and like the ancient alien craze, they've dove more deeply. Dove? Dove? Diving? They're... They've divin. divin. That's where we both came up with that at the same time. <laughs> well, I initially <laughs> wanted to say divin, but I was like, that sounds not correct. But they I don't, dive. They've been diving. They've been diving more deeply into the alien thing and so they're getting a lot more specific so i feel like we need to go back to the fundamentals <laughs> this trip that they took sounds like it was kind of a last minute decision it was a three-day long road trip through montreal and sightseeing at niagara falls that they considered to be their honeymoon it sounds really nice i bet they ate a lot of arby's it, they probably didn't it was arby's a thing and... i don't think it was although the two had actually been married for about 16 months they left spontaneously at barney's request with about 70 dollars in their pockets on the way home they were pretty tired but there was a hurricane coming And Barney wanted to push on home to beat the weather so that they would end up driving through the last night of their trip instead of staying in a hotel and getting some much needed rest. They figured they would make it home by about 3 a.m. So, the timeline... (laughs) Why do I keep saying timeline? Line. Line. Mommy made me mesh my M&Ms. Oh my. Timeline. Mami me mamu. Mami mamu moo. Is that right? (laughs) Me moo moo. I know it's not moo moo. (laughs) Faster. The timeline of events that we've talked about so far 
actually came from a recorded hypnosis session in which Barney Hill recalled his version of what happened to he and Betty on that night on their long drive home, which we will discuss later in this episode. Initially, neither of them remembered anything really. They knew that something strange had happened and that they were missing about three hours during their drive. And when they became aware of themselves, there's those air quotes again, they were 35 miles further down the road than they thought they were, and they couldn't figure out why. They were also missing two hours of time, but they didn't know this at first, although both of them were wearing a watch. Both watches had stopped working. They had ticked their last talk. (laughs) What movie is that from? (laughs) Ticked its last. I don't remember. I like it. I've never seen it. I've seen all the movies. I'm a junkie. It wasn't memorable. It's on Hook. It was Hook when they killed the croc. Dustin. The TikTok croc. What's his name? Dustin. Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman. Mm. Dustin Hoffman. (laughs) Do you like him? Like, mm. Captain. (laughs) (laughs) You know, some of us have a Captain Hook thing. Some of us get our underwear at Kmart. (laughs) My dad lets me drive down the driveway. (laughs) Gotta watch Wapner. I love Dustin. Wapner at four (laughs) o'clock. You just took the sexy ride out of it. (laughs) Silence. So both Betty and Barney were dirty. Their shoes were all scuffed up and Betty's dress was torn. What in the world could have happened to them? What outside of the world could have happened to them? A few days after returning home, Betty was so perplexed by this that she called a friend of hers from the Pease Air Force Base named Major Paul Henderson. She told him that she suspected that they saw a possible alien aircraft, and she told him when and where it happened. From there, he checked radar data from the area... And this actually did show a possible unidentified aircraft in the area and that there were two reports that night from other people who stated that they had seen something strange in the sky. These reports were included in Project Blue Book. For those who aren't aware of Project Blue Book, it's a study that began in 1952, the third of its kind. Let me reiterate, 1952, the third study on alien aircraft of its kind in that time. Anyway, it ended in January of 1970 after a termination order was given in 1969. The Summer of Love. I bought my first real six string. I bought it at the five and dime. I played it till my fingers bled. I was given a termination order to stop Project Blue Book. It was the summer of 69. The goal of Project Blue Book was to systematically catalog UFO reports from around the country and scientifically analyze the data. From there, the goal was to determine if UFOs were a threat to the national security of the U.S. There were 12,618 reports collected and analyzed, and after the government determined that they were not a threat, they shut the program down and put out the following ruling. No UFO reported, investigated, and evaluated by the Air Force was ever an indication of threat to our national security. There was no evidence submitted to or discovered by the Air Force that sightings categorized as, air quote, unidentified, represented technological development or principles beyond the range of modern, of smodern, <laughs> the smolder, <laughs> the smolder. I'm going to take you to Shuddy Town. Na- Shuddy Town, here we come. <laughs> Shuddy Town. <laughs> it's drinking at Queens. Shuddy. Shuddy. There was no evidence submitted to or discovered by the Air Force that sightings categorized as, air quote, unidentified, represented technological development or principles beyond the range of modern scientific knowledge. There was no evidence indicating that sightings categorized as unidentified were extraterrestrial vehicles. I probably wiped it off. Do I, do I still have? Both eyebrows. They are. They are, in fact, intact. <laughs> I will lick my thumb so fast. He wiped away her tears and, and her accidentally eyebrow. her eyebrows. <laughs> of all the reports collected, most of them were ruled out as misidentifications of natural phenomena such as clouds, stars, northern lights, things of that nature, or simply a conventional aircraft. During this time, many of the secret reconnaissance planes, such as the U 2, Bono and the A-12 were in flight and in the midst of testing. So many sightings were ruled out due to these man-made aircraft known to be in the area. What's most important about their story being included in Project Blue Book is that it wasn't dismissed, debunked, or explained away. 
it is still a mystery. So at this point, Betty and Barney knew that something had happened and secretly suspected aliens, but they didn't have a clear memory, so they couldn't be sure. A few weeks after the incident, Betty began having nightmares in which she found herself aboard an alien aircraft at the mercy of experiments being performed on her by strange creatures. Barney had developed severe anxiety and stomach ulcers. These nightmares plague Betty and take over her thoughts, even while she's awake. This incident and not knowing exactly what happened to them completely consumed her and it was all she talked about. Barney, on the other hand, wants to forget the entire thing. He does not want the stigma that comes with being a proclaimed alien abductee. Keep in mind that this is the early 60s and Betty and Barney are an interracial couple. The way that I read it, Barney feels that there is enough negativity geared towards them and does not want to draw any more attention than necessary. He continuously asks her to just forget the whole thing ever happened. But alas, Betty can't. She's having these nightmares and finds herself more and more curious over the years as to what happened that night. She can't let it go. Eight years after the incident, Betty elects that they both go under hypnosis with a seasoned neurologist named Benjamin Simon in order to try to recall the night's events, and Barney reluctantly agrees. If you haven't figured out by now, these are the clips that you've been hearing throughout the episode. These particular clips are from Barney's hypnosis session, and remember, he was the one who didn't want to talk about it. I wonder why. You can tell from the audio that he was extremely frightened. Betty and Barney undergo two separate hypnosis sessions with the same doctor, and during these sessions, they both seem to recall nearly identical accounts of their experiences. They both report being taken aboard an aircraft and being put through a battery of tests by short, gray aliens with large eyes. Under hypnosis, Betty states that one of the men on the spacecraft gave her a map of stars when she requested that she be given something physical to take home, because then she would have proof of the encounter. After a long period of time, the man seemed to change his mind, because he took it back from her. She had stared at it for long enough, though, to memorize it and reproduce it on paper. She was even able to point out the home planet of the aliens that she had met. She stated that they told her telepathically that she could not keep the map because they wouldn't be able to explain it to her and it wouldn't do her any good on Earth. While under hypnosis, Betty was able to draw a replica of the star map as she remembered it. Now, this has come into question more than once because astronomers at the time are unable to locate a cluster of stars that come close to matching anything that she has drawn. Many of the details of the abduction and subsequent testing come from the couple's subconscious memories, hypnosis sessions, and Betty's frequent dreams that she described in detailed writing each morning as she experienced them. In all of this information, it was found that Betty remembered that the beings inserted a very long needle into her belly button. When she saw the needle and what they intended to do, she obviously objected, nope. stating, <laughs> Nope! <laughs> she obviously objected, stating that it was going to hurt and that she didn't want them to do it. She states that they told her that it should be painless, and that they were checking for pregnancy. She continued to object, stating, that's no way to check for pregnancy where she is from. They inserted the needle into her abdomen, and when she cried out in pain, she states that the leader of the group gently placed his hands on her forehead, and the pain dissipated. I thought that this was somewhat interesting, because in the late 50s, early 60s, there were no such procedures that included putting a needle into a person's abdomen in relation to pregnancy. But in later years, there is such a procedure called an amniocentesis, and this is now somewhat common. Amniocentesis doesn't necessarily... Necessarily. Meow. <laughs> Amniocentesis doesn't necessarily check for pregnancy, but does check for certain abnormalities that may present in pregnancy. It could easily be coincidental that she came up with this, but it's still interesting that she described a procedure somewhat accurately, and this procedure wouldn't be available until many laters after the fact. Many laters? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> I think you meant many years. Yep, many years after <laughs> many laters. <laughs> many moon later. Two laters. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. She also proclaimed that one of the men quickly came into the room that she was in and began pulling at her teeth with a small tool. No. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> she, uh -uh. <laughs> she asked why they were doing this, and they told her that they didn't understand why Barney's teeth were removable and hers were not. Benny and Barney's genitals were also examined by the men. She talked about their demeanor being very serious, but mostly 
They were calming and pleasant, and they seemed to exhibit different personalities among them. Most of the conversation, she states, was telepathic, and when they did speak, they spoke to her in English. Barney states that they never spoke aloud to him at all, only via telepathy. Another detail that has come under scrutiny is Betty's description of the men that they encountered. When she first described them to investigators, she described them as short guys with black hair and Jimmy Durante noses, which is different than her later statements describing them as short grays with huge black eyes and large bald heads. Most of the contention over the change in detail came from the fact that she only changed her description shortly after hearing Barney's description of the beings while he was under hypnosis. For those of you who don't know who Jimmy Durante is, he's a singer from this time period with a large bulbous nose that is rounded at the end. I'm glad you answered that question because I was gonna ask. Mm, He's pretty famous. It is said that this is the first depiction of the greys, and this description of alien beings is what launched the idea of the greys into pop culture. Although the aliens weren't necessarily a topic of interest or something that was portrayed regularly in entertainment, it's been found that this... It's been found that there was actually an episode of The Outer Limits that was shown 12 years prior to the Betty and Barney Hill incident in which alien beings were shown in this manner. Obviously, they were questioned about this and deny ever having seen the episode, but there are a lot of skeptics out there that say they had probably seen it. This encounter and its subsequent fame also seemed to change the way we look at aliens and the way that stories were told about them. Before Betty and Barney Hill, they were portrayed as the little green men type of aliens that were often friendly and that seemed in ignorant awe of us earthlings, like the little wobbly green aliens with the big eyes. The weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. They have the antennas. Oh, the antenna alien. Yeah. Betty and Barney's story was really the first one to make us think that we should fear aliens or think of the possibility that they may be so curious about us that they might kidnap us and perform tests in order to study us. This idea was terrifying, obviously, and let's face it, people love terrifying and mysterious, so their story took hold and spread like wildfire across the United States. Not surprisingly, this also seemed to launch a huge wave of alien abduction stories across America as well. Lots of people wanted a piece of the otherworldly pie, so it's hard to differentiate the fiction from the reality here. Some of these new stories may have come from other victims who had just been too afraid to tell anyone before, but we'll never know if that's the case or if they were just totally fabricated. Or if it was LSD. Was LSD a thing in the 50s? and In the 60s? Yeah. Yeah, I guess it was. Barney Hill passed away just a few years after the incident, but Betty lived much longer, well into old age. She's done a lot of interviews since then, but details in her story have changed numerous times over the years. Her credibility has come into question by so many skeptics. She is said to be fanatical and delusional with an obsession over UFOs and alien beings dating back to before the incident occurred outside of Indian Head on Route 3. Interestingly, Benjamin Simon, the neurologist who had hypnotized the hills, had his own opinion. He did feel that they were sincere people and that they didn't necessarily make up the abduction story. But he speculates that Betty had such wild dreams that she dreamed the entire incident and woke up from this lucid dream thinking it to be true. Barney had just absorbed the entire thing from Betty's telling of it and subconsciously adopted it as his own experience as well. So, like, would they have made up the whole road trip? I don't know, but he seems like not the type of person who would do that. No, I agree. And actually, he really seems to be trying to keep Loki throughout his life. Like, he just wants to live his life as a postal worker, and chill out, and Betty keeps screwing it up with her drawing attention. He didn't really want this event. No. He didn't want all this attention at all. Betty, on the other hand. Yeah, exactly. Seems like she likes it. I definitely have a hard time with one person being so impressionable as to think that the dream was a real thing. I know that it happens, but it's not really common. Betty may have been the exception to this if she really was as UFO obsessed as people reported. Maybe her dreams did seem so real to her that she took it as reality. Having this happen and then a second person thinking it to have happened based on just hearing it, I feel like this is really far-fetched, even more far-fetched than the incident having actually occurred. So I guess I'll go ahead and insert my two cents here, if it's worth that much. Honestly, I think that there's definitely something to the Hill story. I think that the initial story is real. The account given by Barney Hill, under hypnosis anyway, 
If you've read much about this encounter, you'll find that it seems like Barney just really wanted to keep the entire thing quiet from the get-go, like we just talked about. Betty was a lot more outspoken about it, and she was the one reaching out to different people to tell the story. He was extremely reluctant. Think about it from Barney's point of view. It was the early 60s, and during this time, there was still a whole lot of blatant racism happening here in America. Betty and Barney were an interracial couple, and while somewhat accepted, it was still largely frowned upon during this time, so it seems that he was trying to do his best just to not draw so much attention to themselves. The reason that he was apprehensive, and maybe she wasn't, would probably be because he had experienced enough negativity in his life thus far, and she really hadn't. So she probably didn't realize what a big problem this could cause for this could cause for him. I don't really buy into that because they were both pretty involved in the still ongoing remnants of the civil rights movement. So I think she knew that this was going to be a big deal and likely to cause him trouble, which makes me think that Betty was either extremely naive or kind of inconsiderate. He had likely already experienced behavior from others that made him feel like an outcast, and he seemed to be doing his best to assimilate and blend in with a low-key life, and this was the last thing that Barney needed for that. You know, honestly, you could consider the possibility that she's kind of attention desperate. Yeah, I think there's a lot to that. And that's clear speculation, obviously, on my part, but it's logical. So even through his reluctance to make a big deal out of the incident, he did decide to undergo the hypnosis in order to find out what really happened. I just think that with Barney's standpoint on not drawing attention to it, he would be much less likely to make something up so incredible, let alone sensationalize the story. And while like we said, we believe the initial story, I think that once the attention started to die down from it, she probably started making up and embellishing additional details and continuing the encounter to keep the spotlight on herself. And this is too bad because it completely discredits a person once they start to do that and makes it really hard for people to believe any of it. And I think really once Barney was there to kind of, because he was kind of trying to keep the lid on it, once he was gone, she just... Oh yeah, she just went crazy. Yeah. A writer named Robert Schaefer from a magazine called The Skeptical Inquirer once wrote this of Betty Hill. I was present at the National UFO Conference in New York City in 1980, at which Betty presented some of the UFO photos she had taken. She showed what must have been well over 200 slides, mostly of blips, blurs, and blobs against the dark background. These were supposed to be UFOs coming in close, chasing her car, and landing. After her talk exceeded about twice its allotted time, Betty was literally jeered off the stage by what had been, at first, a very sympathetic audience. This incident, as witnessed by many of ufology's leaders and top activists, removed any lingering doubts about Betty's credibility. In the oft-repeated words of one ufologist who accompanied Betty on a UFO vigil in 1971, he said she was unable to distinguish between a landed UFO and a streetlight. Ouch. Yee. 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 <laughs> In 1995, Betty wrote a self-published book, A Common Sense Approach to UFOs. It is filled with delusional stories, such as seeing entire squadrons of UFOs in flight and a truck levitating above the freeway. In 1966, she wrote that she and Barney would go out at night frequently and that they would see the aliens eight or nine out of every ten trips out. Things that make you say, hmm. I kind of hate the idea of her tarnishing Barney that way. You know, it sounds like he hated it too. I think part of it, I think the initial story, like the initial core of the story is real, real. but I think she started making things up and I don't think he liked that. I think that was part of it too, where he was like, let's just stop. And you know, he was noticing, you know, we all have friends that just add on to things that aren't true. I'm just following the bottom. Oh geez. That's the funniest thing, Betty. Funniest thing. I never believe in flying saucers, but I don't know. Well, I guess I won't say anything to anybody about this. It's too ridiculous, isn't it? I wonder where they came from. Oh, geez, I wish I had gone with them. You wish you had gone with them? Yes. I would have experienced to go to some distant planet. Maybe this will prove the existence of God. Isn't that funny? Were you scared? I wasn't. I wasn't afraid. Well, you say anyway. It was very ridiculous that you and I talking about it. Oh, we got 
getting in the punchments a little later than I expected. All right, we'll stop there. All right, well, people, folks, that's the Betty and Barney Hill story, one of the earliest reported and widely talked about UFO incidents. What do you think about this? Let us know on our Facebook at Bigfoot for Breakfast or on our website, www.bigfootforbreakfast.com, and leave a comment on the show notes. We would love to hear from you. Um, love to hear your opinions on this. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram. Add us and get early info on upcoming shows. Thanks so much for listening to us, and be sure to tell your friends and spread the word. Also, don't forget to push the subscribe button to our podcast. This will update you when there's new episodes and help us out too. And if you have a few extra minutes, don't forget, rate and review on iTunes. See you next Monday. We want to believe. The truth is out there. Fire photons. Pew, pew. My retainer is a Klingon warship. I am.